Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shelf Point Today for Wednesday, August 26th. I'm Mary Kay Grimaldi. And I'm Rich Nation. We're glad you joined us for today's program. Coming up, we will hear from Jeff Corey of the Legacy Foundation as he gets some advice from an attorney on estate, plans, and wills. And Heather Batty of Resort Services will give us a tour of the Resident Activity Center on the island. But first, we want to tell you about tomorrow's lunch outing aboard the Suzy Q. You'll travel to Cape Harbor to go through the locks and then on to Fathom's Restaurant. At Fathom's, you'll find a casual, modern ambiance. The menu is a mix of international cuisine with authentic flavors. Guests will enjoy mouth-watering burgers, seasonal salads, imaginative pizzas, and more. The trip tomorrow will leave the docks behind the Village Church at 10.45 a.m. To sign up or for more information, call the Island Greeters Desk at 454-2136. And now for all you baseball fans out there. It's time to enjoy a game in style. Better than enjoying a game in person is enjoying a game in a skybox with a spectacular view. You can take in a Fort Myers Miracle Baseball game at the Remodeled Twin Stadium on Friday. Food and drinks will be served in a climate-controlled skybox, or you can enjoy the option of sitting outdoors as well. The cost of the trip is $39, which includes park admission and food and beverages. What a deal. Court pickups for the trip began on the island at 5.15 p.m. with an approximate return time of 10.35. On occasion, people may incur financial or family changes that require updating their estate plans, wills, and trusts. Jeff Corey from the Legacy Foundation visits with attorney Kevin Kyle to discover why you should go through these documents every two to three years. Hi, I'm Jeff Corey from the Legacy Foundation, and today we're here with a Legacy Moment with Kevin Kyle, an estate planning attorney here in Fort Myers, who's board certified in wills, trusts, estates, and even income tax. And Kevin, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Kevin, we have uh, a number of questions our residents often present to us and thought this would be a great opportunity to get some uh, advice from an attorney. Um, regarding your estate plan, how often should a resident uh, take a look at their re and review their estate plan, their wills, and things like that? I generally recommend that everybody look at their estate plan every two to three years. Oftentimes people will have financial changes or family changes that require a change. And sometimes in that span there will be law changes that may require a minor change here or there in their documents. Okay, great. We often have residents that come from out of state and they bring their documents from Michigan or New York. Are those documents valid? Should they have them reviewed by an attorney? Well, I see a lot of amateur law practiced in this area. I will have a lot of people who come in and say, I moved here from Michigan, for example, and my neighbor told me my documents are no good. The general rule in Florida is that if you bring documents from Michigan, Indiana, Ohio down to Florida, and they were valid under the laws of that state, they'll be valid here in Florida. However, there are certain provisions of Florida law that may require a change. For example, our homestead laws are very unique. We have very unique laws on how much property or money you have to leave your spouse at your death. So it's not that the documents are invalid uh, in and of itself due to the move, but there may be some minor Florida changes that we need to make. Okay. I know one of the important things in looking at your will is uh, who you a point as your personal representative. Some, our residents sometimes refer to as an executor in other states. What kind of characteristics do you look for in your personal representative, the person that's going to handle things for you? Well, I think the first thing you have to look, look for is someone that, that you trust and someone who you believe is honest, of course, because they will be managing your assets and have access to all your assets and all your personal information. I think you also have to have someone who has some wisdom and by that I mean I will have people who come in who think that they can handle everything, that they can handle the investments, they can handle the legal work, they can handle the accounting work. Well, none of us can do everything. So sometimes estates are simple and people can do a lot on their own, but sometimes they're more complex. And I think you have to have a person who realizes what their strengths and weaknesses are and get help from professionals when they need it. Right. I, I also think that you have to pick somebody who has the time. 
I will have clients who come in and their children are very, very successful, doctors, lawyers, accountants, business executives, but frankly, they just don't have the time to do it. And I think that's something you need to take into account as well. Hmm. And finally, sometimes you'll have children who just don't want to do it or persons who just don't want to do it. They can't handle the stress or the anxiety of doing that type of job. So I think if you're picking a friend or a family member, you have to take those factors into account. Hmm. Now, we often hear about the evils of probate and probating a will. Is, is probating a will here in the state of Florida, is that as bad a thing? Cost, I mean, tell us a little bit about the process and how that works and what the costs are of probating a will. Well, there's several different kinds of probates in Florida. Uh, generally speaking, you can have a formal probate, which is when you're trying to probate assets having a value in excess of $75,000. That involves filing the will, filing a petition for administration, running a creditor's period, uh, noticing uh, specifically known creditors, and then marshaling all the assets, doing an inventory, doing an accounting, filing the tax returns, and then closing out the probate. Obviously, as you can tell, it's a lot of paperwork and can take anywhere from six months to a year to complete the process. A summary probate is much simpler. It's when a person has probatable assets having a value of less than $75,000. That can be completed in a matter of weeks, and it's not a very difficult process. But generally speaking, we want to avoid those processes by properly utilizing either trusts, joint ownership of assets, or transfer on death or pay on death registrations. Mm. It's like anything else. Uh, if we can avoid the probate court, it saves lawyer fees. Generally speaking, a summary probate can cost anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500, and a formal probate will cost you a minimum of $3,500. So again, if it's something we can avoid, it's, it's worthwhile looking into. Right. So you talk about you know, checking your assets, making sure you have the right beneficiary designations. Do you like the use of a transfer on death on brokerage accounts and payable on death on bank accounts and things like that? I use them. I think what you have to do is sit down with your advisors and determine what's the best approach. You know, you, I have a lot of people who come in and insist on having a trust, but if all you have is a small bank account and IRA, you don't really need a trust in most cases. So I think you have to sit down and determine what do you own, number one. And number two, what your goals are. Hmm. If your goals are very simple, I pass and all my assets go to the kids, and all you have is an IRA and a small bank account and maybe a car, you probably don't need a trust. But if you come in and say, I can't trust my son or daughter to handle their inheritance, well, then we're talking about doing a trust. Hmm. So it's all relative case by case. And again, I think for people to say a trust is, is the blanket rule for all people is not, is not necessarily true. Okay. You mentioned revocable living trusts and maybe doing some things maybe to set up for children. I often hear residents say, I don't want my beneficiaries to get a lump sum all at once. Correct. So can you tell us a little bit about a revocable trust? When should people look at a trust and what the benefits are? Well, I think the benefits of a trust first are, as we talked about a little earlier, avoiding probate court, number one. But a, but a revocable trust all, also serves as a good means to set up restrictions on your beneficiaries. So for example, for myself, I have a trust that says, if my wife and I both pass, my kids who are currently uh, 15 and 17, don't get their money till they're 30 because I don't want them to get the money to, to blow on a car or a boyfriend or a girlfriend at a, at a, on a whim, so to speak. And I'll have clients that, that have even older children that they say either can't handle money due to you know, a, a marital situation, a substance abuse problem, or they're just not good with money. And the trust serves as a good way to do that, either by layering out distributions over a number of years or at different ages, or, or I'll have people say the child gets the income off the money the rest of their life, and when they die, it goes to their descendants, or combinations thereof. So a trust serves as a much more private and predictable vehicle to do that type of planning with. Great. What sorts of things are helpful? What should our residents sort of pull together before they come visit the attorney? What, what sort of things make your job easier? I think the most helpful thing to me is to have a listing of assets. What somebody owns, how is it titled, and what it's approximately worth. Because then we can evaluate the options for avoiding probate, number one. Number two, I'll need that to figure out 
uh, do we have an estate tax issue? And three, it just gives us a global map, or, or I like to call it the x-ray, to say, here's what we need to do. Because I find a lot of times people don't have that all coordinated. They'll have a will that might say, I leave everything to my daughter, but then they'll have beneficiary designations that leave everything to their son. And with that, we can coordinate everything, make sure that there's primary beneficiaries and secondary beneficiaries uh, as appropriate. Okay. And if there are things that need to be titled jointly in a trust, transfer on death, we can do a, just a little checklist to say, here's what to do with each item. Great. Now, you were here recently for a seminar. One of the things you talked about is communication with your family and kids and loved ones. Yes. How do you, you know, what, what kind of advice do you give to people? I know some people say, I don't want my kids to know anything, and others say, ah, I'd like to share everything with them. What do you, what kind of advice do you give there? I think it's a case-by-case -case determination. I mean, obviously, the clients know their family and their situations much better than I do. I generally take the approach anymore that it's better to give more information than less particularly as someone gets older. That way they can get help where they need it if, if that's warranted, number one. Take some of the surprise out of things because I had, do get a lot of cases where people go, mom or dad would have never have wanted that. Mm -hmm. But if they hear it from mom and dad, they have their chance to object and guess what? It's, they hear it straight from mom and dad as opposed to me right. uh, as a surprise. Uh, I think the middle ground is, is to give them my name and number, you know, your name and number, if, if you're involved, the accountant's name and number, and the investment advisors. So at least that way they do have some comfort that things are being taken care of. Mm -hmm. But I do tend to lean as I do this more and more to, to more information is, is better. It just, uh, as one might say, takes the sting out of it if it's right. something the children might not like to see or hear. Great. Well, one final question. We were talking about advisors. Does a, does a resident, should they be coordinating efforts with their CPA and financial advisor attorney? Do you get involved in that sort of thing, working with other advisors? I do, and I generally find that we're the last involved, so to speak, because people don't typically call their lawyer until there's a problem. But I find that most of my more successful clients generally have a financial advisor who gives them typically advice on a day-by-day -day basis almost in these market times. Mm -hmm. They'll have a CPA they call at least once a year. And if the financial planner and the CPA are, how should I say, uh, with it, so to speak, uh, they know when to call me and when to get me involved. And typically, that's why I'm saying I'm the last in line. When there's a problem that really needs addressed, a good financial planner or CPA knows when to bring me in. Right. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's really good, useful information you shared with us today. And thank you for being here with us. And we'd like to thank Kevin Kyle from the law firm of Green, Schoenfeld and & Kyle for being here at Shell Point today and hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you. The Resident Activity Center on the island is often a hub of activity, hence the name. It's the place where residents can find out information about events, make reservations, fax and mail documents, sign up for activities, once again the name, and enjoy a card game, pool, or even bowling. That one's through the magic of electronic gaming. To give us a roaming tour of the Resident Activity Center, also known as The Rack, here's Resort Services' Heather Batty. Hi, I'm Heather Batty with Resort Services, and today I have a great opportunity to introduce you to the Resident Activity Center, also known as The Rack. So follow me inside. So right now we're inside the Resident Activity Center, and I'm here at the Greeter's Desk. I'm with Lynn Castellano, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what she does at the Greeter's Desk. In the summer, the greeter's desk is manned uh, five days a week, uh, weekdays from 9 until 12. In the winter, we are also have somebody here from 12 until 3. And basically what we do is we greet people when they come in the door. And, you know, sometimes we think that maybe it's the only contact that a person may have, that we would say good morning and have a good day leaving. One of our really big jobs is to do the scheduling for the Suzy Q, which is what I have here in front of me, the book. And when people call, we write down their name, the date that they would like to go, and any members of their party. Uh, and in general, we just 
answer questions. If people call and they have a question about something or someone comes in and they want schedules, we are in a position where we can help direct them to the appropriate place or person. And that's kind of my big job. <laughs> So now we're at the Island Service Desk. This is the hub of the island where you can come and find out any information. And we have Gabby here who can fill you in a little bit more. Gabby, what do you actually do at the Service Desk? Uh, well, a lot of things. Uh, first of all, we have many services that we offer to our residents. A very popular service is the Postal Service. We um, can do the basic services like mailing letters, packages. So Gabby, I find it really interesting that we can ship all these boxes. Yes, we can uh, uh, ship priority mailboxes. We have these boxes here uh, handy, so if a resident needs to ship something, they just come by and get one of the boxes. We do have envelopes as well, and of course they can bring their own boxes. As long as they're not heavier than five pounds, we can ship those two. Okay, so up to five pounds. Yes. What if I need to send a fax? We have a fax machine right there, and um, a fax is 150, whether it's one page or five page or 10 pages. As long as it's um, uh, within the area code 239, it's free. Great. Other faxes are 150. Okay, perfect. That's a great service. It is. And then we also have our copy machine here. Yes, so a resident can help themselves making copies or I can help them if they don't know how the machine works. It's 10 cents a copy. 10 cents. And if it's for Shell Point business, then it's free of charge. Oh, great. So if one of the courts or the residents are making copies for an event, they can do yes. that for free. Yes. That's great yes. as well. Uh -huh. Now, did I also hear you are a notary? I am a notary, so if uh, residents need a uh, document notarized, I can do that too, yes. Wonderful. We do have, um, of course, the academy classes. Right now we are regis taking registrations for the classes, the academy courses. Um, we do registrations for all the happenings at Shell Point, like trips and other events. Um, we have uh, the shopping bus which is very, very nice to, to have. Uh, so residents can sign up four days a week for mm -hmm. the shopping bus, which goes to different stores and malls, and it's uh, good. And the medical bus also. So you're very busy up here all day. It's a, it's a busy place, yes, but I very much enjoy. I like to meet all the residents. A lot of them I meet almost on a daily basis. Others might not know what we have here, so definitely come by and check us out. And if they want to call you, Gabby, what is your number? It's 454-2282. One of the things you can also find at the rack is the library. Here I am outside. As you can tell, it's extremely busy today. We have a ton of readers here. You can drop off library books if you no longer need them. You can check out library books and they always have some library books for sale. Some other things you can do at the Island Service Desk is sign up for activities. You can come and check our lost and found. You can drop off your old cell phones and we donate those. There's also shredding. You can drop off any of your items that you need shredding. Don't forget there's also a service desk at the Woodlands. Thank you, stay happy and healthy. I'm Heather Batty with Resort Services. And now it's time to cover all of today's happenings, menus, and Village Church connections. Welcome to the happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Bev Chandley, and I'm gonna tell you what activities we offer for you here today at Shell Point. We're gonna start with the men's round robin doubles tennis at eight o'clock down at the Woodlands Tennis Courts. From 9 until noon, we'll have Jurassic Travel in the Egret Room to help you with your personal travel needs. The Watercolor Group with Phil Hilton will be here at 9 o'clock. At 9.15, we have card making and scrapbooking. That'll be down in the Tarpon Room on the island. The Ladies Bible Study will be in the Osprey Room at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, we have the Men's Round Robin Doubles Tennis at the Woodlands Tennis Courts. The Model Yacht Sailing Club will be sailing their boats at the Commons Lake at 10.15. And we have the Health Connections class at 11.30, Bar Basics, that's down in the Health Club. 
Moving into the afternoon lineup, we have a 1245 Health Connections class today. Advanced Senior Strength, that's in the health club on the island. Chess will be in the library lounge at 1 o'clock. At 1.15, it's time for Hearing Enrichment Group. They'll be in the Manatee Room on the island. At 1.45, we have another Health Connections class, Balance and Mobility Training Level 1 down in the Health Club. That's currently full. At 2.30, Jazz and Steph will be at the Grand Cypress Room at the Woodlands. Hang on over for a concert. The Bible Study will be in King's Crown at 3 o'clock. We also have a 3 o'clock Health Connections class, Pilates Stretch. That's in the Health Club. At 4.30, it's time for indoor bocce. They set that up down in the health club as well. The singles table at the Crystal Dining Room will be available at 5 o'clock. And the church choir rehearsal will be at 5.45 at the Village Church. 7.15 concludes our activities of the day with prayer and praise at the Village Church. I hope you have a great day today, and we'll see you back here again tomorrow. Menus for Wednesday. In the crystal room, the crystal platter is barbecue chicken with baked beans and corn on the cob. The soup of the day is minestrone. In the Island Cafe for lunch, the special is smoked sausage with peppers and onions with onion rings for $7.75. The dinner special is fried shrimp for $8.75. Dinner specials in the palm grill are ribeye for $19.95 or poached flounder for $15.95. All menus are available 24 hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Welcome to Village Church Connections. I'm David Pavey. Some time ago, Nancy and I signed a contract to sell our house. Following the lawyer's instructions, the buyers penned their signatures on every page of the document. We did the same. The whole contract was, as the Brits like to say, done and dusted. But our excitement soon proved ill-founded. Within a short time, the buyers backed out of the deal, the contract was in default, and we had to put the house back on the market. A year later, we went through the process again with a different buyer who honored the contract. We were happy campers again. One of my friends who is a building contractor tells me of disappointments on a much larger scale than that. He has copies of contracts that are several hundred pages in length, signed in many places by contractor and client and guaranteed by an insurance company. But the performance he reports was at least sloppy and at worst it was fraudulent. Safeguards don't help when one party is not acting in good faith. Little wonder, therefore, that many Americans currently feel uncertain about the value of treaties made with the nations that have not proved themselves to be trustworthy. The summits may prove helpful in the long run, but it could be a very long time before we feel we can trust those who have defaulted in the past. Their track record leaves much to be desired. A contract is no more reliable than the one with whom it is made. Of course, some people are trustworthy, many. Although Samuel Goldwyn uh, claimed that uh, a verbal contract isn't worth the paper it's written on, if you get the oxymoron. My builder friend once constructed four houses for an acquaintance on the strength of nothing more than an order placed over the telephone. But the buyer was a man who never was never late for an appointment, paid every bill within 24 hours. In short, he was trustworthy. So, when God makes a contract or a covenant, we can count 100% on its reliability. Never will it go into default. Never will he change his mind or back out of a deal. What he has promised, he will do. And God has made a contract with us. Think about that. This is the covenant I will make with them. Their sins and their lawless acts I will remember no more. That's found in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, by the way. What a contract. 
When we accept God's gift of eternal life by trusting Jesus Christ as our substitute sacrifice, God not only forgives our sins, he forgets them. Now, we may be haunted by memories of our mistakes, but when we recall them in God's presence, he says, in effect, and I quote Clara Barton, the nurse who founded the American Red Cross, I distinctly remember forgetting that. He forgets. David the psalmist assures us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So, if you're a Christian, take heart. The contract is reliable because the one who made it is none other than God himself. No further guarantee is needed. You can count on it. And thank you for tuning in to Village Church Connections. Thanks for joining us here on Shell Point today for Wednesday, August 26th. We'll return tomorrow when Caitlin Van Scoy will talk to us about the upcoming trinkets and treasure sale that residents can participate in. And we'll visit with a Shell Point resident who was a radio and communications specialist in World War II to hear his interesting tales of flying high on bombing missions. Until then, I'm Rich Nation. And I'm Mary Kay Grimaldi. On behalf of the entire staff here at SPTV, we hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you again here tomorrow.